Hello and welcome here at the Maxim booth on the IBC 2015. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, our next guy is a good friend of mine and he's also a very good trainer and he's got incredible knowledge. Like when I have a problem with anything in Cinema 4D, it doesn't matter how deep it is. If nobody has an answer, I know, I just have to ask him and he finds a solution. He knows it, he knows everything, it's incredible. I've never, yeah, really. I mean, sometimes it's really like scary how, how much you know. So, he's going to show you a commercial breakdown in Cinema 4D, how to handle uh, large dynamic scenes and a lot of uh, breaking glass, I heard. So, uh, give us a warm welcome for Mr. Lars Scholten. Thank you. <laughs> check one, two. Check one, two. Yes. Hi. Well, uh, as Glenn said, my name is Lars Scholten. I am a trainer. I'm from Amsterdam. And I've been doing Cinema 4D training for the last 10 years, but I'm also a freelancer. And we have a lot of freelance projects uh, we do with a very small studio. Um, in this case, uh, if you want to see any cool tutorials about Cinema 4D, me solving problems of my students, you can follow me on Vimeo and see some uh, very cool free tutorials. So for the commercial part, what we are going to do this time is I'm going to show you a breakdown of the following uh, commercial. This is actually a graphic we got from an uh, advertising agency. And what they wanted to do is they want to have a box which would be flying through a mobile device like an iPhone, a tablet and a s computer screen. So they sent us this little piece of concept art and they really want to grasp this kind of look. They really want to have this very bluish look and all these sh sh shreds of glass flying around. And it was up to us to make this happen. So um, we had five weeks, which sounds a lot, but the holidays were in between. So we had Christmas, we had uh, Sylvester. There were not a lot of time to do this. And we only had about three guys. One of them, uh, Olaf Remy from Kreukvrij. He was the art director and also did most of the compositing. Then we had a animator, Marius. He did a lot of all the hand animations. And the last one was, uh, well, me, the guy that makes everything work. Yeah, we did a lot of dynamics. We did a lot of, um, we used a lot of plugins just to get everything right. And it was my task to make this combination work. So, let's start off breaking glass. First thing you'll always do is a little bit of R&D. And really, when it comes to Cinema 4D, there's quite a lot of plugins around where you can easily, which you can easily use to break glass. For instance, there's this uh, free plugin called Trousy. You just fill in the number of uh, parts you want to break and just add a dynamics tag and you're already there. So, just press play. And right now, we got a complete disaster animation. The only problem is, if you're looking at these kinds of animations, and this is one done not by us, by, but by a competition, you can see there's something wrong. I really like the lighting here. I really like the chromatic aberration and things like that. But there's something wrong with the pieces. The pieces are all the same in shape. And this is not really how glass breaks. This is because most of these shatter plugins are based on a Voronoi pr uh, principle. And if you don't know Voronoi, Georgi Voronoi was a uh, mathematician from Russia. He lived about 1800, 1900. He's never seen a computer in his life. But he came up with something like a buckshot of samples. And just by expanding them, in this, uh, in this case, in a scanline method, you get these kinds of shapes. And you might know these shapes for, for instance, uh, let's say the noise shader from Cinema 4D, or even the pavement shader. And again, this is not really how glass works. When you're breaking glass, you tend to have more like a shape like this, a dead center with all these kind of shreds going from the center to the outside of your object. So it was literally back to the drawing board. What we did was going to Illustrator. I love Illustrator as a second application besides Cinema 4D because this integration between Illustrator and Cinema 4D is just about flawless. So here I do a very rough sketch. I didn't bother to do this <laughs> live on stage because it's kind of a tedious process. But as you can see, 
if you're using a decent Pathfinder, you can create all these kinds of shapes and directly import them into Cinema 4D. The only problem is, if you want to import Cinema 4D, uh, Illustrator in inside Cinema 4D, in the old school way, you always had to do it via some kind of downgraded Illustrator file. So we had to save our file as an Illustrator 8 EPS or AI file. And also we had to, and for people who are not in the position, uh, possession of the plugin I'm going to mention next, you have to turn off the preview format to none. Yeah, and I don't like this way of working. Every time I had to export, import, and it was just a lot of hassle. So if you are a member of Cineversity, which is the online American school for Maxon, you can find a free plugin if you're a member, which is called CV Artsmart. And I love this plugin. I have used it a lot. Because first, you don't have to downgrade your Illustrator file or down, sa <laughs> uh, down sa save your Illustrator file. You can just use CC files, CS files, and things like that. And just not only import them, but you can link them directly to your file. So I'll just use a CV Artsmart object, load in my glass, which I have been drawing inside uh, Illustrator, create some extrusions, and just to upgrade the performance, just to increase the performance, I make these guys editable, which is a very easy way to get a better performance in your viewport as well as render. Just as a dynamic stack, we already have a very decent breaking effect. Next part, I'll just create a box, an instance of a box, and move it with a Hand, um, hand key animation straight to the glass, and you can see everything falls apart. And it only took me about five minutes. So, we had all this uh, stuff done, and the R&D for the glass was done. So we got to the modeling of the devices, and this is also where Cinema 4D can really shine. When it comes to modeling, we were not allowed to use any iPhones or, yeah, stuff from uh, Samsung or things like that. Because I don't think these companies want us to show how we can break their stuff. So we actually were in a very cool position of taking all the cool parts of all these little devices and just make up our own. We also added a little script that could turn a completely intact screen with just one go into some that could be breakable. So as you can see, we just modeled these uh, devices already ready to break. So. Then we ended up with a package design. From the design agency, they sent us this yeah, design of a, of a box. And it was up to us to make this work on a 3D model. And for this, I always tend to use body paint. Body paint is a part of Cinema 4D where you can use a UV maps to map out your texture on an object. Uh, most of the time, it is being used for characters and well, more yeah, you, can, you could say star, uh, uh, aircraft or sci-fi stuff or things like that. But it is also a very cool tool to use if you want to do any kind of package design. So just by increasing the size of the UVs, placing on the right position of your model, you can very accurately, and I'm talking about half a pixel or a difference or so, you can easily place your texture on the box. So just by adding a little bevel, we can catch a bit of highlights we have a very realistic box. Then, yeah, my art director came up with a very brilliant idea, slow motion. He is a little bit a fan of the Matrix, I believe, and you have all these kinds of, then something comes in, a and we wanted to create these kinds of effects when this package is going straight to all the glass. And you can actually create some slow motion if you're looking to the dynamics the environment in Cinema 4D, if you're going to the Dynamics tab, you see something called time scale, And by animating the time scale, you can increase or decrease the speed of objects which are linked with the Dynamics engine. You can also use a plugin which is called Magic Slow Motion. It's free. It's from a guy called Nitro4D. Visit this page and just install it because it is a very handy and very cool plugin. What you can see here is I made a little example of a box which is filled up with all these marbles. And I want to tip over this box. So all the marbles just fly out, but not just blah, blah. I want to have some kind of cool effect so it just stops, moves on a bit in slow motion, and then continues in with its original speed. So I just create a very small animation, really, really simplistic, 
just a, a few keyframes for the bank. And right now you can see all the marbles falling out of the box. Next, I want to have this in slow motion. So I'll just add what we call the slow motion tag, magic slow motion. Go to the my plugins, right here, and add this magic slow motion object. And right in the here, you can see, we can actually see, OK, I want to have the time go in slow-mo from, let's say, frame 10 to frame 20. And you can already see it's mm, moving a bit slower. Just decrease the value, and you got these kinds of effects, which already looks pretty cool. If you combine this with some very awesome camera, sh camera angles, you know, you're getting somewhere. So then go, let's go to the next part. We did all the R&D. Everything was already working. We knew what kind of plugins we wanted to use. So then we get to the big part, which is X particles, the rigging of the X particles, and the use of Alembic. And I'm not going to take it easy on myself this time. Let's go live, and I'll show you a few examples. So first off, the use of X particles. Um, in Cinema 4D, we have under the Simulate menu a particle system. The particle system is in Cinema 4D for quite a few versions, and it's not bad at all, actually. The previous scene I was showing you with all the marbles coming out of the box was created with the old particle system. The only problem was this particle system is limited in the amount of particles it can actually create, and we needed lots of them. We needed thousands of them, thousands and thousands of particles for all the little glass shreds we wanted to create. So we couldn't really use this kind of system, so we upgraded ourselves to another system which is called X-Particles. X-Particles is now on version 3. Uh, during the project, we used X-Particles version 2.5. Um, it is a very robust and, I would say, very uh, stable particle system. And if you just introduce a X-Particle system, you can see we can just get all these objects to create the most incredible simulations when it comes to X-Particles. It's rendered on multi-thread. It's very, very fast. So right now, you can see, if I just introduce a particle emitter, it starts off by emission with more than 1,000 particles a second. So yeah, that's kind of different when you compare it with the old system. So I just press play, and even on this laptop, you can see thousands and thousands of particles just being generated in this, um, in this pass. OK. Um, I'm not going to use this uh, file uh, for this. Just open another one, one second. So we started off with these kinds of threads. These are very simple uh, geometries, which were <laughs> very, very small in the, in the final animation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to reproduce these inside an emitter. So again, I'm going to X-Particles, create a system. And the first thing I'm going to create is not a emitter, but something different, which is called a generator. So let's go to the generator objects. And you can see we got quite a lot. And one of them is a generator. And every object I put inside the generator can be linked again to a particle emitter. So just introduce a generator and drag these guys in. Next, I'm going to introduce another particle emitter right here and link this emitter to this generator just by dragging it in. Next, and this is, was another reason why we choose X particles um, when creating this project, we can decide what is going to be the emitter. And in the old particle system, we had a particle emitter, a particle emitter, and a particle emitter. These were about the choices you had, like, well, the old T-Forge, you can get it in black, black, or black. Hmm. In this case, if we are using a object, let's say I got this sphere right here. Oh, this was very fast. Um, I can just edit this as the emitter of my scene. So I just go to the emission. You can see, OK, this object is not a rectangle. It's going to be this object. I just drag in the sphere. And right now, if I just press play, you'll see the particles emit from the sphere. It's going a bit slower because these are actually the little shreds I put inside my generator. So I'm going to tone this emitter a bit down. Let's say at the emission, I only have about 200 at birth rate. 
zoom in a bit so you can see it a bit better. And right now, if I press play, you can see all the shreds just flowing around. Another reason to use this plugin is it is very easy to make some objects which can be used as a collider for these particles. So I'll just create a cube. And to make this a collider, I'll go to my tags, X particles, and just say, this is an X particles collider. And if I press play, you can see all the particles which are emitted just bounce off. I hope you can see this. Oh, bounce off this object. Ah, I'm missing them. Yeah, you can see it right here. So again, it is a very flexible system. And it is very easy for us to use while creating all these glass threads. So it is all going pretty well. Let's go to the next part. And that is, we needed to rig these particles. And I'll just show you why we needed to rig them. Um, it's my job as a rigger inside this project to make the animation or make the animators as easily to animate the scene as possible. And right now, we got a hell of a lot of objects and a hell of a lot of settings to tweak. It was not just one bit breaking of glass. It, there were actually about three glass pieces. We had particles we called it the afterburner, which were all small particles following the big shreds. We had another one. We had another layer, another layer. And at a certain point, this was getting really, really complex. And I'll just show you by going to my view menu and just unfold the entire scene. And you can see, yeah, you know, when it comes to my animator, I really don't want him to go through all this stuff and be very, very scared <laughs> about what can I change and what should I not be changing. So what we did was creating an interface which was very easy for him to understand and very easy to manipulate. So you can compare it with creating some kind of a remote control. And I can show you this in a bit of detail. Um, let's get a little bit easier scene of a robot head. A few of my students will probably say, hey, I have seen this guy. Huh? OK, and let's say I want to control this robot hand. I want just to move a finger or rotate one of the fingers of this uh, robot hand. But I don't want to get into my hierarchy of objects. What you can do now is use Expresso, which is a scripting language inside Cinema 4D, to control this. First off, I'll just start off with a null object and call this one controller. It's just a habit of mine. Next, I'll go to an option which is called user data. And user data is a different kind of way of saying, hey, I really want to create my own sliders. I want to create my own input. So I'll just add a group, call this guy hand. And for the people who are a bit familiar with Expresso, I just dragged it under the user data so it will create its own tab. Add another piece of data. And this is going to be an actual slider, which I will call Pinky. The interface is going to be a float slider, which means I have a slider right here. And you can choose all kinds of data types which you can control, like Booleans, which is a 0 or a 1. You can have integers. You, have, uh, you can have colors, fonts, you name it. So right here, I got a slider, which is called Pinky, which goes from 0 to 1 and doesn't do anything at all. It's just a slider who lives here. To make it a little bit more easy for my animator, I'll just go to my right mouse button, add it to the HUD, and just drag it into the corner Oops, right here, and say, show always, so he has constantly, uh, constant access to this one parameter. And now I can, I can rig this. Just add a expression tag. It will open my Expresso editor, drag in my controller. And right now, you can see I got this node right here with an input and an output port. And I can output the information of this pinky slider I just have been creating. If you want to create a little bit of RSI for yourself, so your arm falls off and things like that, you can go to this output port, go to this thing called hand, and go to the parameter pinky. If you want to be a bit faster, I would recommend just go to your controller, drag this parameter right here, and you're done. A bit easier. Next, I got these joints right here. It's called gewricht in Dutch. Sorry about that. And you can see I can just rotate them around. And I'll drag these guys in here as well. Just start off with one. And I have to decide what is actually changing as a parameter. 
which is going to be the pitch. Drag in my pitch parameter and just link these guys together. So right now, if I'm using this slider, my pinky will rotate. Something like this. That's not enough. It's meh, not doing too much. So what I need to do is add one more node, which is called a range mapper, which will control the input and output values. And you can see it a little bit like a transformator. So just go here to my search field, add range. I got my range mapper right here, and just put them between these two nodes. Yep. So the range mapper now has a few attributes. One of them is what is goes in, and the other one is what goes out. So I could say in is going to be a percentage, which goes from 0 to 100%, and the output range is going to be a degree, let's say 0 to 80 degrees. If I'm using my slider right now, you can see I can just bend the pinky really easy. And I can do exactly the same for the different kind of joints right here. Zoom in a bit again so you can see it. Make a few copies of these, link them, and replace the objects by dragging the objects from here into the dark gray area. And right now you can say, hey, if I'm using the slider, I'm already rotating three joints just by one slider. So this is a very easy way to create an interface which is understandable for our animator. So back to this big project, what I, I have been creating is all these kinds of interfaces to control the particles. Right here, we got a particle dust, which were the very, very small particles. We got particle fragments, particle box fragments. These were particles we actually emitted by the box when it flew through the glass. We got some viewport playback options by disabling some of the emitters, we had a better viewport playback. And we even had a cache mode. The one I'm actually most important of, uh, most proud of, sorry, is the Marius Flimsy Box Controller. Yeah, our animator is called Marius, and he really wanted to be able to change the box a bit in shape, so he had his own Flimsy controller so he could change the shape of the box. I'm very proud of that. Okay, so let's continue again. We had all these parts in place, and then we ended with a lot of problems with the X-particles, especially when it came to the dynamics. For some reason, the smallest part of the particles would not sit still. They were just jumping around like spring beans or things like that, and it was actually quite terrible. So we need to find a solution for this, but first let's see what actually went wrong. So let's go to... These guys right here. Okay. I made this little setup, which is a uh, presentation of a old game I used to play when I was a kid. It was called Spokeslot, which means something like Haunted Castle. And what I did with this game was the following. You had a little skull you could place inside the coffin, and it will fall down through a maze which was inside this tower. And by going through this maze, it could end up with one of these exits and set up one of the traps in this castle. So we had an axe, you could be thrown off a stair, you could be kicked by some kind of skeleton, or we had a floor which could explode, which was pretty cool, actually. Um, so I decided to recreate this in Cinema 4D, just for the hell of it, and found some bit of a problem, and I can show you here right now. First, we got all these objects right here, and what I want to do is I want to make them dynamic, so when the skull falls down the coffin, it will actually bounce off them. So I'll just go to my tags, simulation tag, dynamic, I have a collider body, and to make sure it will actually fall through it, and the dynamics calculation is calculated by every single uh, polygon, I'll just go to the shape and change the shape to what we call a static mesh. Now I'll just go to the skull object right here. For the people who really want to use some shortcuts, or go very fast to the first object, uh, say, scroll to the first object, and you can see I got a group of objects here called skull. Place another tag on it, simulation tag, rigid body, and right now, if I press play, uh, it will probably not work at all. <laughs> the skull will just fall through the entire construction, and that's because the skull is actually a group, and the group is only a null, which means it's null in size, so it will just fall through everything. 
I'll just go to the collision tab again, now the one on the skull, and say I want to have a compound collision shape, which means everything underneath the null will be calculated as a shape as well. And right now you can see if I restart the animation, ah, well, we're almost there, but there's a bit of a problem. As you can see, the hole is absolutely big enough for the skull to fall through, but there is a problem right here, and that's the following. When you're working with dynamics, it is impossible for a dynamics engine to calculate the exact moment and the exact position of one polygon hitting another. It's just not going to happen. So what they did with the dynamics engine of Maxim is the following. I'll just go to my dynamics tab inside my project settings, and here you can find an option which is called the collision margin. And the collision margin is very important. You can compare it with some kind of halo around your object. So when another object comes inside this halo, it's been calculated as a collision. So if you have a very tiny object, you might want to decrease the size of these guys. And right now you can see the skull is actually falling through. Another one which I would really recommend to use is the following. You have what we call a steps per frame. If you increase the value of the steps per frame parameter, you'll also get more accurate results. You have to um, imagine if this is one object and this is the other, and it moves with great speed, like our glass threads did. In one frame it could be here, and the next frame it could be there. So no calculation is actually, or no collision is actually calculated. To avoid this, you can have more steps per frame in the calculation. Let's say, let's have frame 10, frame 1 fifth, 10 2 fifth, 3 fifth, oh, there's a calculation. So by increasing this number, you can have more accurate dynamics solvers. The problem we had was the following. The little shreds we had were so small, it was impossible to have this collision margin small enough to have a decent kind of dynamics calculation. And it did it perfectly for about 95% of all the animation we had, but there was always this the one little particle going astray, which was kind of getting a bit of a problem. So we tried a lot of things. We changed the random speed, we changed uh, the random seed, sorry, we changed the steps per frame, we changed the collision margin, and they just kept bouncing around. So we ended with a problem, and we solved it in, let's say, a little unorthodox matter. I'll show you in the next example. So right now, I got a cast example of a box going through the glass, and there's this one particle here, which is probably hit two or three times by another particle, and it's going out of the scene with an insane speed, and I don't like this. I want to get rid of this guy. So what I can do now is use a method I actually learned from Helga Maus from Pixel Train. You should see his tutorials as well. And he's a little bit into how to connect different programs with Cinema 4D. And one of the new formats which is supported by Cinema 4D is a format which is called Alembic. And Alembic is a format which supports uh, point clouds, it supports particles, it supports splines, it supports cameras. And what you can actually do is use this format to go from one program to another. Especially for real flow, this can be very, very useful, where you can just render out or save out a cluster or a shape from a wave and just import it inside Cinema 4D. Very important to know that is Alembic, you can't really compare with other formats like 3D Studio or Colada or things like that because it's more like a database. You can borrow information from this file while somebody else is adjusting the file from another program. So to do this, I'll just go to File, Export, and here you'll find this Colada file right here. Sorry, Alembic file. I was not talking about Colada, sorry, Alembic. And you see it's, it's an ABC file. I'm not going to bore you with saving it out because it will take about two minutes. And again, it's not that important. So right now, I'm opening my Colada file. And you got these questions. What do you want to import? Do you want to have your cameras? Do you want your subdivision services? Do you want your curves? Do you want your point clouds? everything you need. And right now, if I just import it, you can see I got the entire baked project. It's loading right now, even on a very tiny laptop. And I got a baked version of this crash. So I just press play. And right now, we see the box coming through. And let's see. 
I really don't like this particle right here. Just select it, and I can delete it if I like. I can paste a uh, composting tag on it so it doesn't uh, bother me anymore. But I got complete control over all my particles and can remove all the crazy ones. So by doing this, we really, well, almost there, and we had some very good results. So let's get back to the presentation. Um, yeah, then we had one more thing going on, and that was the following. Um, when we were working on this project, we are not only creating an animation on full HD. They actually want to, uh, uh, to also render posters for bus stops and things like that. And then we were using a plugin called Render Elements from Adam Swap to create different kinds of settings for one scene. So we had one on 10,000 pixels by 8,000 pixels for the uh, bus stops. We had different kinds of render settings for visual uh, animatics and things like that. And maybe you know this scenario where your client is coming over and this goes on and on and on and on. And sometimes you want to make different conversions of the same scene file, just like, let's say, the um, layer comps in Photoshop. So save out different kinds of ways of, well, objects being positioned, render settings, camera settings. I can, I can watch this for hours, right, really. It's absolutely accurate. In our case, it was a bit, a bit more serious, though. <laughs> you can see the final result was actually printed on very big boards. So we really needed multiple versions of the same file. And for this, again, we were using a plugin called Render Elements. But in the release 17 version of Cinema 4D, we were well blessed with a following new feature, which is called Render Takes. And I love these Render Takes. You can find them right on the right side of your screen. I'm currently using my own interface, so let's go back to the standard interface. And right here, you can find your takes. And there's always one take inside Cinema 4D when you're starting off. This take is your main take. You can compare it with the background layer in Photoshop if you want to have some kind of uh, well comparison. So we got this main take. And in this main take, everything is defined as you always have been defining and setting your scenes. But right now, I can just add another take and make modifications which will be different from the original take. And it starts off, of course, with what kind of camera you're using or the render settings you are using, which can be very helpful. But also, every single attribute, every single parameter in Cinema 4D can be overridden and changed in one single take. So let's say, I don't like this box right here. I want to have some modifications when it comes to if it's visible in the editor or renderer. Right now, you can see everything is grayed out. I can't change anything until I make what we call a overwrite. So I'll just go to one of the parameters, press my right mouse button, and I can say I want to overwrite this parameter. And for this take, it is now overridden, and I can change it to anything I like. So again, let's have an override. Let's turn this, uh, this guy off. And the box should be kind of gone. Hmm. <laughs> Not today. Oh yeah, sorry. I only took on a little part. <laughs> should have uh, taken the entire null object. So right now you can see you can make all these kinds of modifications. And this does not stop with only the objects. You can make changes in your materials. You can make changes in your tags. You can make changes in your render settings. Everything is just about changeable and savable. And of course, you can share this information. You can save these guys out. You can make child objects again. And what I like especially, you have a very cool object hierarchy where you can see what you have been actually been changing. So again, this is a very important tool when it comes to the composting part and the rendering part of your scenes. So yeah, that's just about uh, all the stuff we did. So let's go to the final result. Here we go. That was about 12 seconds, five weeks of work. 
You can hold your breath in the meantime. Huh? <gasps> and it's gone. So what I'm really proud of is we actually mixed some of these animations of the particle animations together with some hand animation. Um, for instance, this little piece here just stayed in one position. And there's this other piece of glass coming in. And then with a bit of hand animation, we could just put a little bit more to the left, which gives you more control over your particle animation. So we had time to go in this kind of detail, which was really awesome. OK, this was just about all I wanted to show you today. If you have any questions, please. <laughs> OK, I'll be around in the booth if uh, there are still some questions. Uh, thank you for coming, and have a great day at the IBC. Thank you.